All right, we're back with part two of discussion of the dark design. Uh, science fiction snob here, and Steve is here as well. Hello. All right. So when we just finished off part one, we were just talking about Burton having suspicions about um, what was going on, suspicions about Frigate and Monat with the symbols on their forehead, and we sort of found out that uh, the date of... Um, the final date of everyone dying on the river world is not 2008, but uh, 1983. Uh, go ahead, Steve. You want to add something from uh, we forgot from uh, part one? Well, uh, making such a tidy one-hour uh, recording, we uh, might have rushed the ending with the onto the dark tower stuff, and forgot to mention that uh, after Frigate and Monat left, Alice and Logu were finally brought up to speed about X. We've been leading to it that uh, Alice suspects uh, Burton's keeping a secret. Burton's not really hiding it very well. And finally, Burton comes clean. And Alice, although uh, finally has all the answers and is up to speed and has that sense of relief of knowing what's going on, she is somewhat irate that it took till 32 AR to be uh, brought up to speed on that. But Logu, you know, she's pretty cool. She she took it all right. She didn't seem to uh, mind. And so, anyhow. So we move on to, uh, yeah, so jump cut again, right? Yes. And we, we move to um, Peter Jarius Frigate. And he's in a small state, and he's meeting uh, Tom Ryder and the Frisco Kid. Um, you want to take on, uh, I mean, you know, we just, Frigate just left. And now we're back with Frigate again. Do you want to take it from there? Frigate's story? It's a bit confusing, right? Because he's, yeah. he's, in this place, he's in this place where he does his daily duties. He has to work. It's a nice system. They don't have 40-hour work weeks over there. They figured out that to keep a community running, if you do your part like maybe 10 to 15 hours a week, you can uh, you can be a contributing member and still live a luxurious life. He does, he does some uh, – well, he does all kinds of work. Anyways – and it has him living with this woman that he's lived with for a while. And suddenly we're seeing Pete in this totally other life. Monat's not around either. Uh, we know he left with Monat. And we, we assume they left together, right? Yeah, we, we yes. We yes. don't know, but we assume. Actually, good point. Yes, uh, because they were both gone, we assume they, they jointly split. And so here Pete is. He's been living here for a while because he's even excited about visitors. And this... Uh, Exciting visitor. In fact, the boat's the boat's name, I believe, is Razzle Dazzle. Yeah, yeah, it's got a lot of pizzazz, I guess. Yes, you got to do the spirit fingers when you say that word. Pizzazz. <laughs> yes, um, and it's got quite a crew with, I believe, on Slapagas. Um, <clears throat> We've got uh, Nur al Dim al Musafir or Nur Abdin Ibn al Al Li Halar, or we just we can just call him Nur. Yeah, I, I call him Nur. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, there's Nur and, like you said, Tom Ryder and the Frisco Kid, who also was going under Martin Farrington, I believe. And real in, anyways. Exciting crew. They need crew members. They they don't hide the fact that they're going. Uh, they're going down river, and they've got a brave, strong crew. They're obviously adventurous and bold and brash, and uh, <clears throat> and they're looking for crew members. And Frigate, even though he's got a girlfriend and a life there, applies. And then it goes into actually introducing this Frigate. It go, as we know, uh, Philip Jose Farmer and Peter Jarish's Frigate both have PJF. For their initials, and so we assume Farmer's immersing himself in this story through this character, and as Farmer grew up in Peoria, so did Frigate, and yep. he into all kinds of stuff about Frigate. Tells you lots of stuff, and tells you lots of stuff about uh, Frigate's girlfriend. Apparently, uh, she was raped by her uncle, who became a eunuch, because uh, after she was raped by her uncle, her mother shot his balls off, so... Uh, yeah. We know that her uncle's a eunuch. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, they break up 
because he applies for this position while he's sleeping with her and living with her and they're a couple and obviously he wants to just go sailing and he likely not come back he doesn't so tell he, her about it so obviously he he's, yeah, yeah he leads to them breaking up <clears throat> and to appeal and in, in, in his application it was uh frisco kid martin farrington aka jack london <laughs> who was taking applications who was interviewing frigate at least and, and there was a lineup and and frigate was applying and frigate knew who he was based on the back of book covers and he recognized tom Ryder as tom mix from movies he loved from the silent era a bunch of westerns that he did which and, i i assume is actually probably these two guys i assume that these two guys are probably farmers some of farmers heroes as a kid growing up like guys that he really liked like this was you know, true for him, right? That's yes. what I assumed. And as a classic movie aficionado myself, yes, who's yes, been TCM, who's been on TCM with Ben Mankiewicz, I really like this part. I find it really cool that they immerse a classic silent movie film star who's actually got bravery because he had to really ride those horses. And those guys back then were uh, a lot tougher. <laughs> yeah. They went to war and fought in wars and stuff. You know, they they were pretty tough. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> really cool character, but he's being interviewed by London, and uh, London admits to him through as the Frisco kid that he does like intellectuals. He, he lets on that he likes conversation. He gets bored. He wants smart people, and uh, Frigate lays it on thick. If you want to, if you want to take over, he lays it on really thick, uh, trying to appeal to. Jack London's uh, interest in literature he may not have read but heard about. And uh, even he plays pretty dirty. He talks about uh, Jack London's daughter and knowing knowing stuff about Jack London's daughter. And, and for some reason, Jack London doesn't suspect that he knows he's Jack London, even though he's, he's using these weird ploys. Yeah, no, I think, uh, well, yeah, I figured, you know, figured it's smart. Um, he obviously, he recognized, as you said, he recognized these guys right away and he's kind of like, why are these guys, you know, operating, you know, under, not under their real names? Like who would care about that? So he's kind of interested. He wants to get out. Um, he, he does like these guys, they're his heroes, but he, he's smart enough to figure out, well, you know, I could just come and say to them, Hey, I know who you are, but then maybe they wouldn't take me. So he figures that I'll just, you know, if they want to keep it quiet, I'll just keep it quiet. But I will plant these little seeds in there. He 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 plants these little seeds that makes them think that, you know, he may know them. But then um, they ask a direct question. He's like, what? No, I don't know anything about that, right? But, um, you know, I guess when it comes down to, uh, I think Frigate is very smart in this. When it comes down to getting on this boat, you're going to live on these boats with these people in close proximity. They're, you know, your skill as a sailor, you know, as long as you have a certain, you know, skill as a sailor and a fighter, the rest of it doesn't matter because most of the time you're going to be spent, you know, with, you know, these 10 or 12 or however many people. And you're going to, you know, if you don't like them, you're going to get really bored fast and it's going to be, you know, very difficult living in close quarters with this. So, you know, likability is probably the, actually the most important thing. And I think Frigate plays on that. And, you know, he, you know, he's an author, he's very well read. Uh, he knows these guys are probably, um, you know, begging to talk to somebody, you know, who's well read and they can talk about these things. Um, you know, he can't cannot talk with some guy who's from, uh, you know, zero BC about, uh, um, you know, literature. So, uh, he uses that to get, uh, to get on the, um, on the boat. And I think they have, they're having a party. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're having a party. This is where, that's where Frigate gets, um, you know, his girlfriend says, Hey, I did how come you didn't tell me you were going on, uh, you wanted to go on this boat. Uh, they're having a party and he approaches them and asks them, Hey, did I get it or not? And, uh, they say, uh, you know, he throws in a little more, information about himself to make them say hey this guy would you know me you know frigate would be a good companion and then one of them tells him no actually we we're going to pick this guy because he's you know big and strong and whatever but you know maybe i'll you know maybe they change their their decision on the spot um for those likability reasons and they take him instead is that uh oh, yes he lays it on a little thicker at that point that's when he starts talking about dostoevsky and nietzsche and yeah. uh and he, he, take, he explains his take on London's Wolf Larson, and that's when he 
throws in his daughter and stuff, and, and it really it tips the balance in his favor. He he plays he plays dirty, but and like you said, great point you made. If they're traveling uh, under pseudonyms or you know aliases, uh, why? why would they take him if he reveals their identity? Like, obviously, they don't want their identities revealed. Yeah, well, he says he might out, be able to blackmail out, them. Writing them out's not going to get points, right? Not going to score points with yeah. them. So. Well, he well, Frigate looks at it. He's like, I, I could reveal them, maybe try to blackmail them. But, I mean, you know, you, you, they could just not dump, a good idea. They could slit not his good. throat and dump him off the side of the <laughs> boat, you know. Oh, yeah, He's thanks. still Frigate. He's still Frigate to yeah. us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not a tough guy. Yeah, um, I think the main the main thing I got about this part where we're learning about frigate is, and I put it on. Uh, uh, this frigate seems less neurotic. Like he seems different than the frigate that we're used to. You know, the the frigate that we're used to is all nervous about violence and stuff, but and a little you know slightly neurotic about certain things. Now this frigate. I mean, he seems to me to be less neurotic. Like he's still, he's still, you know, he's still not a great guy in a fight, but he doesn't seem to be as bad or as neurotic. I mean, all those character traits that we've seen that are kind of negative in the first, you know, two books, he doesn't seem to have those as, you know, as severely. I don't know if you great agree point. that or not. No, great point. That's why he's willing to get on this boat. He rolls with the punches. More. Yeah, he, he definitely rolls with the punches more. He's a better person. This frigate here is a better person than the frigate we we've met before. Like, what's going so on? You're, so you're alluding to the fact that this is a different frigate or a changed frigate? Um, well, I, I mean, we both have read all the books. We know <laughs> the answer, but it's you know when I, when I first read this, it's kind of confusing. You're like, now we start talking about frigate and like, what happened? Did he leave Mona? Is this years down the line? What's going on? Right. So I know kind of, it's so it's so great. It brings up what, so yeah, what's going kind of on? What's going? Then there's so much going on. Why are so, we being you know reintroduced to a character and learning all this information about him? I mean, we're not learning new information. We're learning new information, but we're st we're going over his background history, stuff that we didn't know before. But why why are we doing that? We've already met Frigate. We've already have background on him. You know, like it's kind of a little bit. And at uh, this point, it's, we're only halfway through, and at this point. He's got – the book has me where uh, I don't want it to jump back to this story. I don't want it to jump back to that story. It doesn't matter which one. They're all interesting at this point. I just I just want to keep turning pages and seeing what's next no matter, no matter which one we're in because yeah. they're all building up really fascinating. And here's another fascinating thing thrown right into the middle of book three. So there's two frigates. What the heck? Yeah. I, I, I want to re re reiterate that point. Um, it's – uh, you know, it's rare for me in a book. I'm not keen on flipping back and forth between. Yeah, I'm not keen on uh, stories that jump back and forth generally. Um, but in this case, this story, uh, I find the same as you. I'm, I'm reading a story and I don't want it to end. I like, like, you know, it's chops. You're like, oh, damn. I want to find out what happens next. And then you get to the next part and then you know, you're over to this other second story and then you're reading it and the other that. You're like, oh, damn. It's, I want to find out what's going on, right? So all of them are both. All the stories are compelling and interesting. Um, right, right. And it gets to a point where uh, you forget about another one. So it's also a relief like, oh, yeah, what's going on here? Too? Yeah, yeah. And when no, the next exactly. Starts. So it only takes a few seconds. Like, even if it's, oh, damn, it's also like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, what? where are we? Right? Yeah, he does that very well, uh, I think. Um, yeah, too. All right. So we meet Frigate. Uh, Frigate. 2.0 or other frigate or whatever's going on or new you know new frigate I, we're not sure at this point and then it flips back uh, again we have a jump cut and it's back to Jill and she has is the uh, the captain of the training balloon so she's you know at least been recognized as being um, uh, useful um, and you know her skill is being recognized um, she's put in charge of training all the, the balloonists and the pilots. Um, we get some more um, information on uh, Cyrano. And um, I don't know, you want to take it from there? Uh, yep, yeah, you're right. She's awarded the captaincy, much to the congratulations of uh, Firebrass and Cyrano, regardless of the fact that some people might even have. Uh... Oh, no, I guess she, at this point she does have the most experience. Yeah, she's the most experienced. Yes, yes. And uh, 
she is hanging out with Cyrano lots. They fence together and they talk lots, and that gives Farmer more opportunity to give you a feel, take you to the river world, basically, and and talk about. He loved talking about history, going on about history, and and these so, yeah, these characters from history. Yeah, and they talk about Odysseus, and they remind you of Odysseus, and uh, and they talk about Clements, how he doesn't even care about getting to the tower as much as the journey. And uh, and getting revenge as much as the voyage and just getting revenge on John. I don't think Clemens cares about getting to the like. Cyr- Cyrano is not revealing anything about X at this point to Jill, but no. he is kind of stating getting into the fact that we've we alluded to in the previous book that Clemens cares more about the journey than uh, <clears throat> than the actual and getting revenge on John than the actual reaching the end of the river and that that fun journey ending. Um, and then again, it's a short, it's a short clip to Jill winning, uh, their training. It's the Minerva is a training vehicle that she wins the captaincy to, and they do a lot of training and she's the, she's in charge of training everybody and getting them ready for the Percival. Right. And then it, and then it jumps to, uh, Canadian, Canadian content. Yes. Uh, good old Barry Thorne, right? Yep. He's, Barry he lives, Thorne. uh, lives down the street from me. Oh, wait, oh. No, maybe not. <laughs> Man, you should get him to take you out in his blimp. Yeah. All Canadians <laughs> he, know each other. He's super overqualified, a little strange. When Piscator met him, Piscator immediately confides in Jill that there's something very strangely uh, different about him. Yeah, but but Thorne has got more experience than Jill, right? Yes, yes, and uh, one of one of uh, Firebrass's bodyguards even rubs it in a little bit, I think. And yeah, Jill but, wants to sock him in the chops. Thinking that he wouldn't hit her back or something. Jill, yeah, and that this kind of plays into her feelings of inadequacy a little bit. Oh yeah, right away, uh, Piscator. They Piscator when Piscator confides in him while they're in, we're introducing Thor and Piscator is also bringing up a little subplot about how he heard that Firebrass. Here's more Farmer believing in hypnosis that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I never thought of that before, but how Firebrass plans to implement mm-hmm. hypnosis in uh, looking for candidacy for his bigger airship, right? right. And that, that might reveal her, uh, her issues with Dream Go. Okay, so we just had a bit of a technical difficulty there. I will continue from uh, saying Piscator just warned Jill that Firebrass is going to use hypnosis. There's more evidence of Farmer... <clears throat> believing in hypnosis and firebrass plans to use it to test the qualifications of his crew and, and look for skeletons in their closet or whatever. And that's where Jill becomes nervous about the dream gum. I should have, I should mention again that, uh, when Thorn when Thorne's being introduced, he sees, uh, Anna Obranova and, uh, or no, sorry. No, yeah, I shouldn't. Yeah. Anna doesn't, no, no. hasn't arrived yet. Yeah, you're right. Anna hasn't arrived. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Anyways, Piscator warns Joe, and uh, he, he suggests maybe she should go talk to Firebrass and just come clean with him about it. And uh, so she decides, okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come clean and say, hey, I had this one episode since I got here. It was a bad Dream Gum episode. Uh, she, she's just going to come clean and try and uh, reason with him that she had one episode. Piscator warned her, you know, tell her the whole thing that even Piscator has been policing her and uh, making sure she doesn't do it again. And she hasn't, and there's no risk, but she wants to come clean instead of him find out the hard way through hypnosis. Right. Right. And when she goes to do that, uh, that's when that bodyguard brags about, uh, about this. uh, Actually, no, no, the bodyguard, I was wrong. It was about, uh, Stern, yeah, this guy. Yeah. This guy shows up named Stern, right? He's she's going to confide in Firebrass, so she's on her way to his office, and that's exactly when this other dude shows up, who has more experience than her. I right. think Thorne has slightly less. He's a Canadian with slightly under the experience she has. It's almost like he didn't want to. Well, whatever. I won't get into that. But Stern shows up, and uh, Firebrass is, gives him a warm welcome. Hey, wow. I just heard about your resume. Amazing. Come on into my office. Come talk. And that's when the bodyguard's saying, he's in there right now. He's got more experience than you, right? And suddenly there's a commotion. Uh, The guy comes flying out the door and uh, runs down the hallway and collapses dead. And I think, I don't know if he falls out the window or whatever, but when uh, 
when he's diagnosed, he's diagnosed, uh, fire brass quickly diagnoses him with a heart attack. And so this yeah. guy overqualified shows up and, and just in his interview, he get, just gets there while Jill's about to go confide in him. He starts this fight. Fire brass yeah. claims. So Stern, fight. yeah. Fire brass says Stern attacked him. Right. Yes. And then, and then, uh, yeah, it leads to Stern's heart attack, which which Jill's never heard of anyone having a heart attack, nor have has the reader heard of anyone having a heart attack when when practically your limbs grow back on yeah. the world. Everybody's uh, twenty five. <laughs> yeah. So odds are against it. Um, but and and suspicions are raised. So it leads the reader to think at this point, was this guy an agent? What's going on? Yeah, I mean I assume that Stern died because he had a, uh, a black ball in his forehead and he killed himself um, and then immediately after this Firebrass sends everybody to Jill um, Jill uh, you know reveals don't the whole dream gum incident right well, she's like don't worry about it you just you got blood out in your head Wait, I can talk to you about this later yeah. <laughs> no nah, nah, don't worry about it because for I suspect him as an ethical but for he's a pretty suave cool dude for an ethical if he is one and uh, he uh, has the doctor while while uh, she's telling him why she came to talk to him. He's like, "Ah, don't worry about the hypnosis. Uh, just get a head X-ray." Yeah, Ooh, he instantly has this idea to do a head X-ray. Like it's like, right? Yeah, yeah. And he wants and he wants uh, the dead body to have a head X-ray too. And uh, <clears throat> Jill and especially the doctor really speculate like what the heck a head x-ray and they wonder why why does uh he meant he he want this and the doctor for the second time we hear someone bring up the 1983 theory and the doctor finally in 30 okay i'll stop saying the year but finally the doctor also is on to the fact that hey how come i've never met anyone past 1983 except fire brass and maybe a couple engineers right yeah and the doctor talks to Jill about that, and it makes it makes the reader think about that, and then the scene shifts again. Yeah. Well, one other thing I want to add: that he also says that uh, Firebrass basically says that uh, oh, this X-ray will uh, like he he mentions the, you know the psychological abnormalities or whatever instead of hypnosis, you were going to take this um, X-ray instead, you know, implying that somehow the X-ray is going to tell him if you're crazy or not. And the doctor says something like, I don't know, see how this works, right? Like, he's totally, uh, I don't see how this works, but I guess we'll do it, right? It's part a little bit. So uh, the next part focuses on, uh, you know, it's well-written. Uh, it's, it's a good portion, but uh, it's all about the preparation for the uh, the airship. So, and uh, various uh, experienced balloonists arrive at different times. They're being still being trained. The, the airship is getting... Um, uh, getting prepared for launch, and then uh, Anna arrives. You want to take that? Uh, yes, yes. The Announced by the Daily Leak, and at this point, F.C. Baggs, who wrote the funny article about Joe, has been replaced. But uh, Well, replaced an... or <laughs> driven out? Yes, yes, something like that. One or the other. Freedom of the press uh, didn't, didn't go well with the, all the residents, I suppose. Um, but Obernova was announced, announced right in the paper to be more experienced than Jill. And uh, <clears throat> that's when Thorne was shaken when he met her because, uh, yeah, he met her and he, he uh, said he was shaken. He had to sit down and she asked him why. And he told her that uh, he, she reminds him of his wife and she asks if she was beautiful and he says yes. And slowly after that, they actually hook up and uh, uh, live together. They live together? I don't think. Uh, yeah, yeah. They they shack up, and uh, and and Jill walks by. Piscator mentions to Jill uh, before Jill walks by late at night. Piscator and her are talking, and uh, and they live they live in the same hut. Uh, Obernova. It's a little like. Sometimes a month passes or two months passes, and he'll say that I think it was two or three, and they hooked up. The farmer says it didn't take long for them to get together, and I suspect that's because uh, they're they're both 
they both have uh, uh, years past 1983. I actually, I think Thorne might not, but Obernova does, and uh, and I suspect they were married. Possibly, uh, we've talked about this off the record. I believe uh, they were ex-wives, and he just hadn't seen her so long. That's why he was so shaken up, and she took it quite well because uh, you know. <laughs> I won't get into that. But she, um, she says she doesn't know him. Like she implies, he's like, "You look like my my ex wife," uh, you know. And she's like, oh, "Whatever." Like she's not. I, I, that's true. But they hook up. Uh, they hook up shortly after that. And other things in the story lead me to believe later on that. Uh, at this point, I don't. I don't suspect that at this point. But they become a couple uh, in yeah, that, that community in terms of uh, shacking up. Anyways. Yeah. That that just. And, uh, hold on, uh, Steve. That just cut out on the recording. You said that you suspect that something, and it just was a little lag spike. What oh, suspect? I suspect that based. I suspect that based on, uh, based on after the whole story, after having read the whole story, I suspect that they were previously man and wife, and uh, both agents and stuff like that. But at this point in the story, I'm not. When I first read it, I doubt I was quite suspecting that. But they did hook up and uh, and shack up and live together and. Jill overheard them one night, but prior to that, Piscator was talking to her, and Piscator, on his own, being a very sensitive Sufi, was cluing into the fact that there could be ethical agents and brought up the concept to her. He didn't call them ethicals, but he said there could be agents among those who created this world. He didn't call them ethicals. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he admits that it's all speculative, but he does bring up the notion and then she goes into thinking about it and we already know as readers that they exist and by the, and we're we're probably likely to uh, be shown how keen Piscator is at this point and then on the way back from that conversation Jill overhears Obernova and Thorne arguing in some weird language very it sounds definitely like a language, but she's never heard anything she can even relate it to, and it, it sounds so unique that she meant to ask about it, <clears throat> but uh, something distracts her, and she never ends up asking about it, and thinks about it later on. She does think about it later on, and we'll get into that too. Yeah, it's close but, to the. They're they're getting close to the launch of the the airship, and so she kind of forgets about it. But I think that's telling big... the reader that they're ethical. I think that right yeah. there is the re reader because that's they're a big hint. They're speaking a space language, right? Yeah, something different. <laughs> yeah, like something that's not heard. So. Right. And then the scene shifts right after she overhears that and uh, it makes you think the scene shifts to uh, to a letter Frigate is writing while journeying on the river, getting everyone up to speed about stuff. Yeah, so this is kind of a, so Frigate's, you know, writing letters and he's putting them in, you know, some sort of container and putting them down the, the river hoping they'll meet his, you know, he's writing to his old buddy. I mean, this is kind of... You know, crazy, eh? Like, as if, eh, you chance, what was the chance of somebody finding a letter you put in a, you know, a bottle? Um, but anyway, this is a, um, a way for uh, a farmer to tell us a little bit more about um, Ryder and uh, Frisco. Um, there's the retel retelling of uh, uh, Joe's tale about the, um, about the uh, getting to the tower. And, um, also, uh, Frigate hears uh, e eavesdrops on uh, Frisco and Ryder talking about um, X. Right? So he, yeah, he hears yeah. them. And, and Frigate, Frigate is keen and, and tuned into that a little bit and just, just telling anyone who happens to pick up this bottle about X, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's uh, revealing the whole thing, and he, he they go into the Joe Miller story. And like I said, uh, in case farmers reiterating for people that haven't read it in a while and forget, or people picking up the third book as the first book, he reiterates Joe's tale, but then elaborates and gives those that know it a little more. And um, <clears throat> it takes over because this is this is wild. This is wild. The, the, you, we get the whole story in this one letter in a way. And okay, so. Tom Mix actually met one of these Egyptians that went with Joe Miller. And when Joe Miller fell off the cliff, this Egyptian guy that Tom met was the one sole survivor out of those that well, was the last 
was the remaining survivor who got to see the whole thing and be the last one to die yeah with the egyptians that got to the tower and joe tripped on a joe tripped on a on a grill right so anyways uh, yeah. the, the egyptians got there through this boat the guy the the leader was smart he figured out very ergonomic uh iphone type of uh which was really well written like Farmer's got these symbols that he pushed, like like icons on a, on a touch screen, you know? Farmer came up with some really cool stuff, including the thing at the very end, the radar thing at the very end. It's amazing. It's like something that wasn't even in video games for 20 years later. But uh, anyways, yeah, uh, the boat was operated by this cool touch screen thing, and the Egyptians made it. They they got fed. They ate some cans of food, and they they but they saw skeletons along the way. They saw... Uh, Abigail, this I uh, forget Noon's Noon's mother, who went onto the tower, and uh, Joe tripped on someone's grill, and that was another guy. But I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So these Egyptians, they made it to the tower. They got it. The secret door at the bottom of the tower opened for them. A bunch of them went in, except this one chicken dude, <laughs> who uh, who met Tom. Right. Yep. Uh, he was too afraid to go in. They all dropped dead. They go in, they all just drop dead. Some automatic thing detected them. They were the wrong people to go into this tower. They dropped dead. And uh, and so the reader's getting all this information that there's a door at the bottom of the tower that can open if they get there that way. Other people have gotten this far, but they drop dead if they go into it. And um, <clears throat> the last guy, he decided to stay in the boat. The boat eventually goes over a waterfall and he gets crushed or something until it tells Tom Mix the story and Frigate relays it to the guy he's writing to, whose name is Robert F. Rorick. He's an old buddy of his. Right. So, okay. Anyways, the bottle the bottle uh, goes down the river, and even though the river is 20 million miles long, it actually gets swallowed by a croaker near Rorick. Like, Farmer loves his coincidences. It's very Seinfeldian in that yeah, way. Yeah. And, uh, and the coincidences are so much, like, like Tom Mix meeting the Egyptian guy, on the other crew we happen to be following, so we get the rest of the story. And now we got the even rest of the story because Rorick is the guy that accompanied Noon, who died along the way on the trail. Rorick, who happened, whose, whose letter almost got to him, it was swallowed by a croaker fish who died from swallowing it. Uh, five, about five days before or after it passed by the actual guy that letter was intended for. And, uh, and Rory was the guy who Frigga was writing to that actually made it. Uh, whose who's grail, I believe, Joe Miller tripped on and fell over the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> That's, Seinfeld. That's a Seinfeld episode. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, for sure. Um, yeah, it's good. I know you did a great job, uh, you know, summarizing that. There's just one thing I want to add, which is, uh, which is kind of funny. So in this part, um, you know, Fr Frigate is writing uh, to Rorig, and in part of the letter he talks about, you know, he talks about a little story about X and on this river and everything. And then he says, uh, what is it here? Um, Too bad I hadn't thought of something like this when I was writing science fiction. But the concept <laughs> of a planet consisting of a many millions kilometer long river along which all of humanity had ever lived, have ever, had ever lived, had been resurrected, or a good part of it anyway, uh, would have been too big to put in one book. It would have, to, it would ta have taken at least 12 books to do it anywhere near justice. No, I'm glad I didn't think of it. So... <laughs> That tells you a lot. It tells you he wishes he could write way more. And you should read the short stories he wrote. The extra short stories are amazing and the lost chapters. But yeah, uh, they are good, yeah. you know, he wishes he could have written it a lot longer, I bet. And I don't blame him. And that's a bit of a self-pat on the back, I think, too. I think so, too. He's kind of uh, saying, wow, what a great idea I had. <laughs> He's kind of a uh, sideways uh, humble brag, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's a good, you know, that's a good summary of that. And, again, so after Frigate's Letters... Um, jump, uh, jump cut, and we go back to Jill, and uh, she's been um, made. She's first mate of the uh, airship, and the they launch the airship, and as well, uh, Greystock is launched in the Minerva, the training balloon, uh, to go bomb uh, John. Do you want to take uh, take it from there? Describe yeah. it in more detail. Okay. Okay. I get yeah. Steve to do all the work. Eh? I just set it up and let him do all the work. <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, for the second time in a row, we cut to Jill being not, uh, being awarded uh, position to adulation and applause. 
Um, this time, like you said, uh, second in command, which which basically is best of the rest and the only position that was up for grabs. Uh, the highest position, pardon me, that would have been up for grabs. Uh, yes, the Parseval is launched, and it's the longest uh, airship ever made by humans, longer than any on Earth. I guess, like you said, Farmer liked blimps and thought they'd be, uh, they'd be popular. 820 meters long, almost a kilometer long. Wow. And uh, 328 meters at its widest point across. <clears throat> uh, uh, the first thing they noticed, and here's Farmer with his numbers again, uh, was that the mountain heights height estimates were way off. They uh, they were originally written to be six kilometers high, but now there's a lot of leeway as they dip as low as 1.5 kilometers high, and that way the blue like other things well. It's just a lot easier to have the mountains not quite six kilometers high. Really blocks out a lot of sun, you know. Uh, yeah. So. So it's good that he lowered the mountains a bit to 1.5, um, but that's one of the first things uh, they discover. Even though with all their technology, they probably should have been able to tell that from the ground. But uh, they uh, they they flew over the wrecks, but they decided so not to be seen by the wrecks because they don't want to alert them for Greystock's attack. Yeah, Greystock leaves to attack the wrecks. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think that's the. I mean, the key part, point I think is this: is the whole thing with, uh, um, yeah, Grace Talk is going to go, and they're um, heading to the polar mountains. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The like the the Minerva is off on its own, and then um, with a small crew, Grace Talk yeah. leads a small crew. Yeah, of two others or something. Yeah, a couple others, and then um, um, the. Uh, they're about to go. Um, they're about to go through the polar mountains, right? They they hit yeah. they hit the polar mountains. They circle around and they find an opening. Like they can't get over the polar mountains; they're too high. But yes. they find a small opening, and they're about to go through. Um, Cyrano is the pilot. He's about to take them through, and then it's another jump cut, right? Absolutely. So we don't we don't get Greystock. They basically yeah they jump cut with Greystock heading one way, the Parcival going through a hole, and Jill wishing she could take over for Cyrano, but she wouldn't dare humiliate him like that. And she knows he's got probably the best hands there anyway. Yeah. So she lets him do it. But yeah, like like my inclination too. When someone else is driving, I feel like taking over on them, right? But so we have, we've all had that, I'm sure. And, yeah. Uh, and a... Jill, Jill goes through it, but doesn't doesn't embarrass. It's a nice little. It's well written how how stuff like that would happen. <laughs> and there's a there's an interesting, uh, you know, Farmer does the uh, the launch of the airship from, you know, guys on the ground announcing it, like an announcer from their yeah. perspective. And that's kind of a little humorous there. So, Absolutely. Yeah, we're skipping parts because this is a long story and so much yeah. happens. Right? And, and we want to not just talk about what happens, but what it, what the implications are and, uh, and yeah, other stuff that yeah. goes along with it. The philo there's... The philosophies that accompany these things yeah i think we've you know we've we covered very quickly that part we don't need to get into detail that you know the reader can read it um you know we got the significant parts out of that um so the next so again you know so uh, you know we're left at a another dukes of hazard type move uh, time right the cyrano is about to they're about to go through the uh through the polar mountains the the hole in the um not, i mean not a hole a dip uh, break in the mountains and it's very windy you know are they going to get through you know can they survive and then jump cut uh we go back to um frigate there's a lot more information about uh about frigate how his parents met um uh, also another story of um coincidence and chance and they start mentioning about how here, here, this is the first time I mean, you probably suspected before that, but this is the first time we go, you know, uh, f uh, in in you know, us hearing frigates' thoughts. He mentions that, hey, you know what? I'd really, it would be really interesting to. Uh, he's talking, uh, you know, he's the story. Uh, he, he how it'd be interesting for him to meet um, somehow how Burton comes up, and he goes, and he says, you know what? I'd really like to meet that guy, uh, Richard Francis Burton. That would be cool. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second, haven't you been traveling him for with him for you know 26 years on the river? What what's going on? That's, so that's the fly thing. I think sometimes, like just in case you have haven't figured this out yet, here you go, right? And yeah. So it's gonna insult those that have figured it out, and it's gonna be like, ah, hello, McFly. Yeah. For those that, that don't. 
yeah so there's ob so if you didn't get it before there's obviously this is a you know this is a different frigate we don't you know um you know based on what's been going on you know the reader probably suspects that this is the real peter frigate and the other one is somehow a uh, an imposter um, yes. obviously obviously an uh, an agent that is somehow you know taken up um the uh, the persona of Peter Frigate in order to, you know, watch Burton along with Monat, right? So we don't know where they are now, but this is, you know, we, it's obviously this Frigate has never met Burton and he's totally off somewhere else. Uh, we also hear more information about um, about uh, the Nurse story. Do uh, you want to yes. talk a little about that? I know you like, uh, you like his, that character. Yes, yes, and uh, just to add to what you said a bit, Farmer, uh, I believe, is telling a bit of his own story through uh, Peter and the, the Peter 2.0, and uh, by telling so much of his background, because this is a lot of background we've gotten on the new Peter so far, like three three background stories. Yeah, we've gotten more uh, background on the new frigate than we did, than anything we got about the old one. Yeah, yeah way more. Yeah, long, long-winded sections, too. Definitely long-winded sections, and, I, and they're great. I love them, but yeah, I think so it's doing a bit of uh it's pardon me it's philip doing a bit of an autobiography at the same time yeah yeah but uh, we were talking about just before you go on we were talking about this a little bit uh off air and um you know we we're talking about whether maybe at the end of this whole series we'll talk about some of the theories of the books and stuff like that but you mentioned i don't want to get into too much detail about this but you mentioned that you know farmer may have written this and then written frigate and then decided, hey, the story would be more interesting if that wasn't the real frigate afterwards and, and put the stuff. But it seems to me that, um, you know, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, you know, it seems to me like he's done so much more, like he didn't do that much about frigate beforehand, so much information about himself, i.e. frigate. So maybe he did plan this from, you know, based on the fact that he's going into so much detail about frigate now, detail that he did not even get close to in the, you know, the first book. Here, here's, but maybe not, because there is one mistake coming up in book five. Frigate 2.0 is the frigate we follow the rest of the way, right? Yeah. And in book five. And Frigate 2.0 remembers and reminisces about the time from book one when he was in Goring's concentration camp with Alice, and he's thinking back to it and reminiscing. And this is Frigate 2.0, and that happened to Frigate uh, 1. Oh, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't take about that. talk about that. Book five. <laughs> We gotta wait till we get there. All right. All right. But anyways, everyone, but, forget I, you heard that. That's a clear mistake, though. I'm I'm saying that's a yeah, mistake. Yeah, maybe it that's a mistake. Really, yeah. Doesn't really kill any of the story. That's just one little reminiscing part he does because Phil, uh, Philip likes to ramble on about thought. Like you'll go in when someone's thinking, that could be ten pages. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and and uh, and there's a mistake. There's a flaw in the in the storytelling. So maybe he did change his plan along the way. Maybe not. I will. I I think because of that mistake and 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 the shape the the non-clarity on it i don't know if we'll be able to tell whether it changed the story halfway through or didn't but yeah. i love it i love the second frigate it's a great ad if it's an ad and it's a great idea if it was an idea from the start but yeah i would add ideas probably too if i was because you immerse yourself into a, i imagine he'd immerse himself into this world as he has through the character and uh, and who knows? Maybe he was getting ideas along the way because because his his short story ideas after the series was done they're very innovative. So mm -hmm. I, w I wouldn't be surprised if he just keeps thinking of possibilities along the way and and always being a step ahead of of anyone else thinking about them. Yeah. All right. So you want to keep going about Nur? Anything about him? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it gets into a long bio about him, but I'll break it down a little bit. He was born in 1164 A.D. in Cordoba. He traveled most of the known world at the time, which would have been Asia and Africa, becoming a Sufi master along the way with disciples. Uh, eventually, he finished his world travel, like complete world travel of the known world at the time, by touring Europe and uh, even gaining audience with King John, who's in the first boat, obviously. And the That's Rex another coincidence. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Frigate asked him, hey, how the heck? This skinny guy like you traveled the barbaric world in 1100 to 1200 and whatever uh, without getting killed. Come on. And, and Noor basically explained that uh, even back then, uh, no one mugged the poor. So he looked, 
he looked like a poor guy most of the time and if he felt the need to and he, and he made money through juggling and telling stories and magic but if he uh needed to he was smart enough to put himself uh what, what, how, under, the, how, under the protection of the locals yes under the protection of either state or religious jurisdiction whichever was stronger in the area and uh, that would gain him audience with them, and then he'd probably have the charms enough to be like, "Yeah, we'll pr we're protecting him." You know what I mean? Yeah. And so he got around, and he was clever, and he was uh, probably had a great life because he lived all the way like people a hundred years ago. The average lifespan was forty-seven. You know, uh, here, and and he lived to be ninety-four, and, and other people back then did live a long time. Michelangelo lived to be ninety something, and I believe Leonardo did too. I'm not sure, but. Mm -hmm. Anyways, they lived very old, and some people like I, I believe wealth and uh, and being intelligent probably. <laughs> yeah, wealth especially I think would be. Yeah, wealth and not <laughs> having to you know backbreaking la labor. Yeah, so this whole uh, section is you know about frigate chance uh, and and Nur story. So we get yeah, to a Nur, little bit about Nur. He's an interesting character. I, I you know I, I think he's pretty good, and he's kind of. Um, you know, he seems a bit um, like you said. He's you implied this earlier that he's um, he seems to be more ethically advanced than uh, you know perhaps the average. He's also a Sufi. That's right, and and Sufis aren't exactly overly common, but they're two hu main characters in this story. So Farmer clearly had a lot of respect for that uh, sect. Yeah, and. and uh, and I love both characters. Yeah, they're great. They're great. <laughs> so then uh, move. we're moving on. Another jump cut. We go to Clements, who we haven't seen very much. And this is actually, like, we've we've talked to him on the radio, but this is the first time we're actually, I think, we're actually with Clements, right? So this part, um, you know, Clements is still, It's he's having dreams of blood axe, even though it's been, you know, over 12 years since he, I think it was around uh, AR-20, where he uh, he uh, uh, betrayed blood blood axe, so he's still having dreams about it. So he has a dream of uh, b about blood axe, and there is an attack on the boat by Greystock. Yes, sir. Yeah, you handle the attack. You're a battle guy. You handle the. <laughs> I, I I honestly I don't want to talk about it uh, too much because I want the reader to read it. I just I want them to know that there's a attack i don't want to get into too much detail and spoil it like i i i do you're right i enjoy the the way that farmer describes the battle scenes i don't know why they're not it's not like he's a military expert or anything i mean he seems to know enough about uh you know military operations to describe it well uh he's got a good imagination it's just well described i i just enjoy you know uh you know my favorite part of the whole series is in the next book where the the battle between the the two boats oh not to give anything away but um yeah i just i find those the descriptions that he does just very interesting and well done so um i'm not gonna uh i'm not gonna describe it myself but i will say that um you know Greystock we find out is a traitor so uh this kind of gives you a little information about how far john uh king john's treachery goes right Greystock is supposedly has hated john this whole time because he betrayed him but he's actually been working for him and it's been years right Greystock's been uh, you know kept back he didn't you know he hasn't uh the reason that he's betraying john is because he um he's been promised the second uh second position uh the number two position on the the rex uh when he gets there um and then of course you know, Greystock mentions that he's he's got plans to get rid of John himself and take over the boat himself. Uh, but um, you know, he's this is how far this planning has been going. He for years, you know, Greystock's given the job of taking the Minerva because he hates John almost more than anybody except maybe Clements, and he's so he's nurtured this hate and this you know this idea that he hates John um, for all these years. You know, he didn't even go on. Um, Clement's boat, right? He stayed to, uh, you know, use the Minerva. I mean, partially, I guess, because he can, uh, you know, he can get to John's boat after if they attack, you know, they sink Clement's, then they're easy to get to John's boat. But still, like, that's like, you know, how long has it been? It's been four years or so since, or more, since 
um, Clemens left. Like that's a long time to carry out a uh, uh, this kind of operation. I would think. I don't know. What do you? Uh, what's your thoughts? Oh, great synopsis and uh, amazing. You're right. There's people's skill at keeping secrets, like uh, Frigate keeping quiet about the real identities of his traveling companions, Greystock keeping quiet about his allegiance to King John, and uh, Monat and Frigate one keeping their mouths shut for decades. Yeah, people have a really good skill at uh, at uh, uh, presenting a false identity. Yeah, so um, I I won't give you the just to yeah just to finish up I, I won't give you the you know the details of the attack on the boat but the the main thing uh, of of the attack is uh, you know Greystock you know kills and t- or ties up his fellows on the Minerva he's the only one involved in this no one else is and he he um, talks to Clemens he says hey we just want to do a flyby before we go because his job is supposed to be to kill the Rex we just want to do a little flyby before we go and uh, uh, get the wrecks, and they're like, uh, yeah, okay, no problem, but just don't fly over top of us. And of course, he's like, oh, yeah, whatever. He over th- he overthrows the boat, uh, the the Minerva. You know, he's he's gone and he's tied up uh, the uh, the other crewmen initially, but then he just shoots the pilot and takes uh, over. Uh, I think he throws out everybody else in the control room. He shoots the pilot, kicks the other two out. And then uh, goes to attack the um, uh, the the uh, Mark Twain uh, Clements boat, and it's not successful, but it is uh, there is some damage, and he jumps out. Um, I can't remember if like everybody else, the Minerva blows up, uh, so every all the crew who are tied up die. Uh, the two guys who, uh, the, of course, the pilot's dead. There's four guys in the control room: Greystock and the other three. The pilot's dead. He blows his head off. The other two jump in there, are pushed out, or they jump into the water. I think one drowns, the other one uh, survives, and Clemens picks him up. Is that correct? Do you remember? I don't know if you... I think so, yeah. I think uh, one of them survived, and Clemens picks him and, up. And Greystock jumps out, and we don't know what happens to him, right? Uh, that's right, actually. I bl- Actually, no, he blows up, with, he goes down with the ship. I thought he jumps out before, and he... No, 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 I'm pretty sure about this. He sets these, the bombs in the boat. He's got like four large bombs that he's supposed to drop on John. Uh, he, he drops two torpedoes. They miss. Um, he, and he's got four bombs. He got he I think he just got out, but, he, but it blew up right be, so close to him getting out that he, he didn't make it. Yeah, because he, he sets... Would... I thought I remember reading, he sets a tor- timer, and then he's about to jump out, and I'm not sure if uh, he, he... I he was led to believe he didn't make it, but it did, does not... It's not clear on that, so it's cool that we do have different takes on whether he made it or not. But... I don't think he's back in the story. I, I think he missed because he's behind the second boat. I don't think he gets back in it. And like he's he's missed the boat basically, right? Yeah, he's missed the boat. That's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's a good little scene. Um, and then once again, jump cut. We switch back to the to frigate and the razzle dazzle. And then if we weren't sure that this is not the um, if we were if you're still unsure if this is the same as the other frigate, we find out that Frigate has been on the Razzle Dazzle for 26 years. He's been on from about 7 uh, AR or ARD after Resurrection Day to the present, which is, you know, ARD 30 or 3 or so. So he's been on for 26 years. He's been on the boat. Um, he's getting sick of it. I th- yeah, they're all... Maybe they're all getting a little sick of it. So they come across um, a new a state. Uh, they hear of a state called uh, Novo. Uh, you, maybe I should get you to pronounce this. You're better at uh, these pronunciations. Nova Bohemo. Oh, bo- 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Take over. No, Nove Muno. Nove Muno. Is that how you pronounce it? Oh man, it's Spanish or something. Nove Muno, but it's New Bohemia. Just let's just New say Bohemia, let's just call it there. New Bohemia. New Bohemia for people like me, right? And, yeah, and the guy's name is hard to pronounce too. Pogiobracht. Yeah. Pogiobracht. So, um, in New Bohemia, there's been a dump of ore, right? So, for some reason, the the guy who's the head of this state knew, you know, has a whatever he knows that there's a, a bunch of ore in this place and he starts digging for it and this is basically another um 
you know, instead of a meteor, there's a dump of ore there. He digs it up, and they become is another state that's very technologically advanced on the river world. So, uh, right away, you know, the reader probably should suspect this guy of being an ethical, uh, uh, an agent or something, because you know, how did he know the ore was here? Like nobody knows. And uh, I believe they sent say that the ore is dumped. It's like in layers, right? Like as if somebody poured a dump truck of something and then another dump truck on top of it and another another. So it's, you know, completely unnatural. And there was no way that he would ever uh, know to do this. So it's kind of suspicious right off the bat. So uh, this guy wants to, uh, the head of the state wants to, oh, sorry, that's not true. He's been, um, he's been um, mining this stuff and he's been, you know, using it to protect himself. Um, but uh, he's got four steamship, got four steamships up front protecting his state. Small ones, he's yeah. Strong, yeah, yeah. But he hasn't done anything else. Uh, then um, uh, the Razzle Dazzle shows up, and uh, you know, frigate. Of course, they hear about this place, and they go, "Hey, uh, now that um, they want to, uh, if they want to get to the uh, tower, why not?" Frigate comes up with the idea to build a blimp. You want to take it from there? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I believe the first one to object, or the only one to object the most, would have been uh, Martin Farrington, the Frisco kid. And uh, he would get no end of ribbing from Tom Mix about being chicken to fly. But uh, eventually, because the other three were into it, he uh, actually... What happened was uh, Frigate suggested this idea. He goes, I've been thinking, if we ever get the means by which to build a balloon, would you guys try flying there? And because he was thinking of Jules Verne, he's he's he likes science fiction. I think he is also a science fiction writer. And uh, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he is. There's still a lot of things that are true about the first Frigate did impersonate him well. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, Frigate saw Frigate suggested the idea even then. Uh, Frisco kid said no, and uh, and then Frigate sees this uh, brass charm on this woman, and she explains, "Oh, that's, I got that down the, cost me so many cigarettes and blah blah blah." <laughs> and they found the state, like you said, and Frigate, and then uh, Tom and Frigate and Newer come up to Tom and uh, Tom and Martin and say, "We got an idea." And uh, Martin goes, I think I know what you're thinking. And Frigate wants to propose to them the blimp idea. Now that he's got the materials that he can build the blimp, uh, he's like, let's do this, right? And that's what he's thinking. So he hasn't told them yet. And Martin's like, oh, I, I'm way ahead of you. I know what you're thinking. You want to steal one of them steamships and yeah. make our way up the river quicker, right? And Nur and Frigate roll their eyes <laughs> and, uh, and explain no. Let's go flying. And here we go again. Uh, uh, Martin objects and Tom ribs him about it. And uh, and Frigate's sick of it. Sick of keeping the secret. Sick of all this. He's like, let's okay, forget it. This is too real. I'm, I'm not going with these guys. If they want to go, they'll go. I think he didn't quite say that. Or, or I don't even know if he thought that. But that's clearly where he's coming from. I he, think that He does want to be involved in the stealing. And and uh, and he wants to fly. He doesn't want to travel anymore. He doesn't want to go on the boat anymore. And, and if they want to keep going that way, well, let them. He's gonna he's gonna figure out a way to fly. So he's coming clean with them and giving them a chance to join him by actually saying, "Well, that doesn't sound like the guy who." And then he relates some Jack London story that Jack London's never told him. Yeah. And, uh, and then he says to Tom, uh, "Well, that doesn't sound like." Or no, no. He doesn't say it to Tom. He just does it to Jack. And he lists like a couple anecdotes about Jack's real life, right. Jack London's real life, that right away they're both... Uh, they both know. Both, both Tom and Jack are like, what the heck? And they both stand up. And Nur's not with... Actually, Nur's not with Frigate, but he's nearby working on something on their boat, right? Yeah, yeah. No, and, uh, they go by Nur to uh because they they say okay don't move don't move they, or you're, they grab them right they, yeah they basically say you're coming with us and they're going to interrogate him and suddenly the traveling companion of like I've, i don't even think i've had yeah i don't i've never worked with anyone that long so i can't even imagine knowing someone that long and then suddenly you're apprehending them like you suspect them of being a spy right yeah but I, that's basically what happened uh and then we learn a lot we learn a lot they take them into another room 
They pass by Noor, forget nods. They say, just act normal, smile and nod, whatever. And they go by Noor. They go into room on their boat, I think, right? Yeah. Below deck. They lock the door and they start interrogating Pete. And uh, maybe you should take over. Well, uh, I mean, basically, this is another way for the story to come out again, right? So, um, you know, the two of them come clean about who they are. They talk about, you know, what's going on. They talk mainly. They talk between themselves. You know, hey, uh, what are we going to do with him? How does he know about this? And they're like, uh, they're like, oh damn, we should have, you know, we should have laughed and and said, hey, we're we're, you know, they start talking about X. Uh, and what are we going to do? You know, we haven't seen him in so long. What's Hello. going on? Frisco and uh, Mix come clean. They um, they actually start talking about X and saying, hey, you know, where's uh, we haven't seen X in so long. We don't even know what's going on. What does he know? Is he a spy? Uh, maybe what are we going to do with him? And, uh, you know, of course, Frigate can hear all this stuff. And then they say, they afterwards they think, oh, you know, we should have just laughed it off and said, you know, yeah, we're, we're going under... You know, under our own names for some reason, but the, because they reacted so strongly to it, Frigate knows there's more to it than that. So they basically come clean and tell uh, the whole uh, the story that X has told them, which is that this whole world is a study in order to try to uh, you know study humanity. Um, and they uh, they mention uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they mention that they they were shown. One of them was shown the the aura by X, like what your aura looks like, what an aura looks like. That's right. And the other one wasn't even visited. He was just told that uh, he'll believe you. Like tell yeah. him all about this. And uh, it was Tom that was visited, and he was told to tell Jack about it. Tell your buddy. Yeah. And this is the and this is our first and this is the reader's first uh, time hearing about this. Sometimes we're 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 here about one of X's visits a few times throughout the story, but this is the reader's first time hearing about this one. From for, yeah, for these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, so, you know, we find out that um, these two guys have been trying to get to the tower for the last, you know, basically since the beginning. And uh, one additional uh, one thing added to this, uh, we find out that uh, Nur has been eavesdropping. And so they, they like they hear him, they open the door and he's like there and he's just sort of like, hey, how's it going? Uh, have you been eavesdropping? Yep. Uh, and he mentions that he saw, you know, he saw the look on Frigate's face when you guys took him to the boat, and I knew something was wrong, so I came here to find out what's going on. So now they're all, they're a little bit pissed off. They've, you know, they're supposed to be keeping this secret. Now Frigate knows all about it, and Nur knows all about it as well. And Peter was grateful to Nur for uh, being so considerate. Yeah. So they're basically brought into the... Um, and Nur and Nur says he's been part of the story the whole time anyways, and Nur's been keeping a bigger secret than Frigate. How's that? Well, Nur was also visited by X, and Nur is one of the one of the people that was supposed to travel with them. And X told Nur to travel with them. Nur reveals that he was also approached by X shortly after Tom. Yeah. And suspects that X might be a liar. Yeah. Yeah, he comes. He he's like he's like he goes a little farther. Like they wonder where's X? What's going on? And Nur just comes right out and says he suspects X is lying. Do we, should we why 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 should we believe him? Uh, yeah. This doesn't seem to add up, and it is a little bit. The whole thing doesn't seem to. You know, yeah. the reader's been yeah. we've been like eh, it's a little bit, but you know, Farmer is definitely pushing it on us a little more that to think that hey, maybe there's something more, maybe X isn't as as you know, great and awesome as uh, he um, he uh, is appearing to be, and then another jump cut. Is that were you uh, were you good with that last part? Did you want to add anything before we jump? Uh, actually, uh, did I miss anything? With them, they they uh, build a semi rigid blimp in eight months. They trained for a while, and uh, Poggio Brat stole the blimp from under their nose yeah. because he suspects, he suspects them of uh, like I think he, he was he changes his story with on the ship. He so, has a yeah okay. Let's yeah. Let's go back to him. What does he he tells them? What's his like? They're gonna build the blimp with him, and he says, "Yeah, yeah, I want to, I want to build the blimp." And what what is his reason for building the blimp? Like Poggio Brat. What's why does he, he want to go? He wants to get to Virolando and yeah. join for to the second chance, and uh, he want, he's he's announcing his his uh, thing as a chancer when he leaves, so he can hand the the chancellorship of the state over to the next guy. 
And uh, so he retire. He plans to retire when he leaves and uh, join the Second Chance. And he puts. Uh, but his story, I believe, his his date was past 1983, and he changes it to 1983 when he's on the uh, Rex later on. I think. I don't mean to jump too far ahead, but I, I think that 